Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. My father was very much of a naturalist. I traveled extensively with him. My preference of a boat is to be in the middle of nowhere. I like the outdoors. I like animals. I like to live amongst them. Martine Collette grew up surrounded by wild and exotic animals. As a child, she spent time on safaris in catching camps that trapped animals for zoos around the world. As an adult, she decided that helping animals would be her life's calling. In the 1960s, Martine was a successful Hollywood costume designer. By 1976, she had 50 animals and had purchased 160 acres in the Angeles National Forest, creating the Wildlife Way Station. I was probably the first sanctuary of this type uh, created in the United States. However, my start was in Hollywood, it was fashionable to have exotic animals as pets. And my husband was in the motion picture industry. And so I got to meet a lot of the people who had exotic animals. And pretty soon, generally sooner more than later, they had issues with having those animals. And they would call the zoo and they would say to the zoo, I would like to donate my ocelot, my monkey, my leopard, my whatever. And the zoo will say, well, no, thank you very much. We have all the ocelot, leopards, monkeys that we could use, and um, thank you very much. So what do you do then? And then the Hollywood phone lines began to ring, and then somebody will say, well, didn't so-and-so marry some gal that came from Africa? And that made me an expert in every field right off the bat. And I took my first animals in the early 60s, and uh, they have not stopped coming into the 2018s. Since it opened, the Wildlife Way Station has rescued, rehabilitated, and given permanent sanctuary to over 76,000 wild and exotic animals. Yet Martine still recalls the sanctuary's first acquisition. Yes, it was a mountain lion. It was on exhibit at a show in this very small cage. I felt sorry for it. And I said, I would buy it from you. And it wasn't until some months later that I realized that by purchasing, I was contributing to the very issue that I didn't want to see happen. And of course, we learned. Four decades later, Martine has won many awards and accolades, and Wildlife Way Station is home to more than 400 wild and exotic animals. Still, Martine considers improving the lives of the animals to be her greatest achievement. Being able to make a difference for however length of time, 
to the quality of life for the animals. Animal care is always the most important thing. Animals require everything we require. Food and shelter and an opportunity to raise young and an opportunity to be able to move and an opportunity to be able to live a life for which they were designed to live a life. And being somebody's pet in a household is not necessarily giving them that. I'm not going to say a blanket statement that all pet owners are bad people. They're not. But when you look at the amount of unwanted animals that are exotic animals, you sort of have to say and ask yourself, maybe you should take a piece of the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. And I'll give you some examples. You buy a baby monkey, and it's the cutest thing in the world. I tell people, don't buy a baby monkey. Have a baby. They'll leave home sooner. You'll have less responsibility. Because while it's a baby, it's amazing. And it's all yours, and it requires you. When it grows up, it becomes a mature animal. Instincts kick in. Reproduction desires kick in. A man who owns a female macaque is fine until he brings in a girlfriend. And the girlfriend now has to compete with this macaque. The macaque doesn't understand that there is a problem. So sooner or later, it bites the girlfriend. Then it has to be quarantined or it'll be taken away by the authorities. And the man that has a choice, you choose a girlfriend or you choose the monkey. I recommend they choose the monkey. I am not against the people. I'm pro monkey. I want the monkeys to have a chance to be who they are and live a life that they're supposed to live. Martine aims to provide the animals with a habitat and lifestyle that is as close as possible to life in the wild. But where many sanctuaries are non-contact, Martine doesn't discourage human interaction. I believe captive animals should have human friends because they're never going to go out in the wild. And this is a controversial subject. Some people don't believe it. Some people do. I happen to believe it. Um, I like the animals trusting us. When I want to look in somebody's ears, I want to be able to have them come over. I want to look at their ears. I want them to open their mouth for me. I want to see the rear end. I want to be able to give them a hand injection if I need to. I want them to be comfortable enough so that we don't have to tranquilize them as many times to do some basic performances that need to be done. Those basic performances are usually carried out by the way station's resident vet, Rebecca. I feel incredibly privileged that I get to go to work every day and, you know, see the tigers. If I have a bad day, I can go and visit with the lions. Um, to me, it's a privilege to get to, to work on them. Um, but it's also constantly stimulating, intellectually, Working at the way station is physically stimulating. It's a lot of climbing and hanging off of things and working outside in this environment. So it's fun and different every day. I have two favorites right now. Bolero, who's our big male lion. He's wonderful. <laughs> Although he marked me in the face not that long ago. I walked over there with my coffee cup because I go say hi to him in the morning and he was snuggling at the fence with me mooing and then he just turned around and got me in the face and the coffee and I was offended and he turned around. Um, Bolero, and then we have an elderly hyena named Gulliver who is in, uh, has chronic heart disease and um, in the wild hyenas usually only live about 10, maybe 15 years, but in captivity we keep them well into their 20s, sometimes into their 30s. And um, we almost lost him a couple years ago and we hand fed him several times a day for months thereafter when he was not eating and um, facing death. And so I just got to where coming out and sitting there and scratching him, he's a pretty special. This place has a unique history. And I like the idea from a veterinary perspective, my mandate's very clear. We're not breeding, we're not exhibiting, we're not selling. I need to keep them healthy and give them a good quality of life while they're here. And that means I have carte blanche to do what they need. And as a vet, that's what you want. 
Much of Rebecca's work needs to be carried out with the animals under a general anesthetic. After all, the wildlife way station's residents are dangerous wild animals, and incidents at sanctuaries are common. In 2013, an employee at Joe Exotic's Greater Winniewood Wildlife Park lost a hand in an incident with a tiger. In the same year, an intern was killed by a lion at a sanctuary in California. And in 2016, an employee was attacked by a crocodile in an Australian wildlife sanctuary. As you'd expect, Martine has strong feelings about exotic pets. A lot of people like to keep reptiles. And by and large, reptiles can make excellent pets. They can. There are things like ferrets, and they're very playful, and they enjoy, and they have a wonderful time. So yes, there are smaller animals that make great pets. But it can't scare the neighbors. It shouldn't be able to eat the people. It shouldn't require such care that you are being cruel to this animal. The animal has to get something from it for their own life. It's got to be good for both parties. And yes, I know there are wonderful pet owners in the world. There are. But when you look at a whole, when you look at the entire animal welfare. Again, I go back to my Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. And if you cannot guarantee that every animal is going to be well and happy, and, then you probably shouldn't do it. Although Martine is against keeping wild animals in captivity, she's realistic about the possible benefits of captive animals. This is a very difficult argument. And it's been, there's lots of pros and cons, and it depends who you talk to. I find that most people, unless they have seen something, smelled something, touched something, felt something, basically it's not in their world, and it doesn't mean a lot to them. I think children need to see the wonder and the magnificence of animals. They need to be able to connect to animals some way. And I know a lot of people will say, yes, but there is films and there is pictures and there is books. It's not the same. There are pictures of apples and there are pictures of trees, but it's not the same as an apple and a tree. So I don't know what the future is going to bring, but for the sake of the animals, I think for people to care about something, for them to protect the animals, they need to care about the animals. And to care about the animals, they need to be able to relate to these animals. They need to be able to identify with them. They must have some connection. Otherwise, why would they care? So I think it's important that we always maintain a connection with wildlife as well as domestic life. Whether that be wild animal parks, or whether that'll be zoos, or whether that'll be some other arena they will yet to be developed, but I think people need that. And after 40 years in animal rescue, Martine also applies her pragmatic attitude to the future of facilities like hers. Ideally, all of us should be striving towards putting ourselves out of business. Ideally, but then there is the real. And I'm not sure it's going to happen in my lifetime. Perhaps it will, but I doubt it. I would never want to see a world without animals. I would never want to see a world where children do not live amongst animals. To me, it is absolutely critically important that people learn where we come from, who we are. We are a species like any other species. We're just smarter. But our roots are in the same place with everybody else. moment I met Allie, I mean, the moment I met Allie and the moment we 
started rolling around and hugging and playing and this and that, I knew that I don't want to be an orthopedic surgeon. I want to be whatever this is. I want to do this. Bob Ingersoll never realized his ambition of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. And Allie would turn out to be the chimp that changed his life. Allie was the older brother of a chimpanzee named Nim Chimsky. In 1973, two-week-old Nim was given to a family to be raised as a human. The story of the controversial experiment was told in the 2011 documentary, Project Nim. It was the most joyous experience of my entire life to be with chimps. And I, I knew that that unconditional kind of a, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, the, the relationship, that the space between the chimp and you is a beautiful spot if, if you do it, if you understand it, if you recognize it. And I did pretty much immediately. And, uh, and it was, it was something that I didn't want to give up, and I'm, here I am 40 years later. I uh, became a primatologist, and I have a master's degree in primatology from the University of Oklahoma under the psych department and an undergraduate degree in psychology. The experiment involving Nim and several other chimps set out to explore the concept that only humans use language. The chimps were all taught American Sign Language. The chimps involved were more than just pets. They were raised as human members of the family, taking pet ownership to a different level entirely. I saw them as my friends immediately. I mean, I, I interacted with Allie on the first day as if he were my, gonna be my friend forever, just like a human friend, no different. And, I, and it surprised me, because I thought it would be like a dog or a cat or, you know, it wouldn't be like it was, and I can't explain that to you. Chimps engage you in a way that you're engaging me and that I'm engaging you. The NIM project drew a lot of criticism. Much of it centered around the way head researcher Herb Terrace saw NIM and his fellow primate participants. He lived a hard life, and he got bounced around a lot, and he was looked at by the people of powers that be as as the subject of a scientific experiment, as Herb Terrace says in the film. He never saw him as anything other, and this is a quote directly from him, anything other than a, the subject of a scientific experiment. I thought that was fairly arrogant of him. Scientists' understanding of chimpanzees and of animals in general at that time was still emerging. Knowing what he does today, Bob would have done some things differently. We've come a long way in the last 30 or 40 years in terms of animal behavior. We know they think, they plan, they feel, they, they have emotions that are very similar to ours in their context, uh, but you don't know what's going on in the back of my head any more than, than we know what's going on in their head, and we can't think for them. Bob was involved in previous similar projects with chimpanzees at the University of Oklahoma. Working with Washoe, who in 1966 became the first chimp to be taught to sign. I worked with Washoe and Ali and, and several other chimpanzees uh, over the course of the time I was at the University of Oklahoma. You know, I, I saw myself as a scientist and someone who was interested in finding out about chimpanzee behavior. Uh, it didn't occur to me that, that captive animals have baggage that, that really kind of transcends the, the, that ability to collect data that isn't tainted by captivity. Chimpanzees are unique in the animal kingdom. They're as intelligent as a five or six-year-old human and capable of abstract thinking and planning. This often leads humans to forget that they are still wild animals, including some of the humans involved in Project NIM. It was one of those baptism by fire. If you can do it, you are, you do it, and you're good at it. And if you can't, you're weeded out fairly quickly. I mean, lots of people worked out there briefly and got bitten or, or got scared or realized it wasn't for them or chimps are stinky and they, they smell like chimp poop and, and this and that. 
The average chimp is five times as strong as a human, and many people have been severely injured in attacks by chimps. Although Bob and his human colleagues were somewhat naive to the dangers at the time, there was never a serious incident. No, no, Nim never, never once bit me. He occasionally came close, like rolling in rough and tumble play, you know, but I knew when to slow it down and when to go, hey, 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 Nim, Nim, hey, hey, buddy, you know, and then calm him down and, hey, you don't want to bite me, you know, and, and my method is not, because I'm obviously not a big guy, my method was, you don't want to disappoint me, and that worked for me. You know, and so I, I was one step ahead of that. You know, I don't want him to react or do something that he would not want to have done, but sometimes they just don't have the cortical control that humans do. And so in the heat of play, there might be, a, you know, a, a situation where, where he goes a little bit further than he should. So I could read that. But, but he never intentionally ever tried to bite me or attack me or any of that. No, we were, we were buddies. And, uh, and, and that's not always the case with all chimps, but Nim was a special chimp to me, and I think I was a special person to him. When the research project came to an end, the chimps, including Nim, were sold to a pharmaceutical testing laboratory. I call this the chimp wall of fame. So these are all chimp friends of mine. Uh, this is a, a painting by, or a drawing by a chimp named Moja, one of the smartest chimps I ever met in my life. These are Washoe paintings, I think. This was in uh, several museum shows, but this is uh, signed by Richard Leakey, who did this painting with Washoe. So, uh, so I've had an interesting and uh, somewhat rewarding uh, career with chimps. Uh, I, I don't know about the word rewarding, but more than at times trying and emotionally draining and, uh, and very difficult emotionally. But, and some people couldn't stay in it because it was, it was tough. It was tough to, to see this happen to your friends. Uh, but I, I don't know, I felt like I needed to do what I could. Being friends with chimpanzees, you might think Bob would be willing to take one on as a pet. Well, you know, there's literally millions of dogs and cats out there that need a home. You know, let's let's solve that problem before you go out and get a monkey. You know, we don't we don't need exotic animals necessarily. I just think that you can get almost as much from a dog or a cat as you could from any exotic animal, and you don't put baggage on that the dog or the cat. So uh, so I'm glad things are changing. I feel very, very strongly that uh, that the emotional side of this is, is part of what leads into a situation like that. And, uh, and like uh, Charla Nash, for example, who was attacked by Travis the Chimp, uh, I think that, uh, that, you know, those folks are, are caught in a weird spot, you know, because they got their animals uh, not in a malicious way or not with any bad intention. They just didn't know and, and were misled by a breeder or someone who, who gave them the animal. And, and then they found out that, oh no, that monkey loves me, but not my grandkid, you know, and that puts people in danger. I mean, capuchin monkeys, as little as they are, they can put a big hole in you. And uh, I've actually been bitten by a capuchin monkey, and I can tell you this, it was a three-legged monkey, weighed about two and a half pounds, and it was one of the worst bites I've ever had. I actually had to consult my doctor. <laughs> when the NIM study ended and the subject sold to medical testing, Bob's life path was again decided by a chimpanzee. He began to get involved with animal activism in an attempt to save his chimp friends from what he saw as a tragic fate. Legislation passed in 2015, making it illegal to use chimps in invasive testing. And private owners too began looking for alternative homes for their chimpanzees. 
You know, nobody wants a three or four year old chimp. Maybe, but a six year old chimp you definitely don't want. I mean, because big chimps can be dangerous. They're not as fun, you know, because most people are looking for a child replacement. You've heard it, I'm sure, a million times. It's my baby. That's a good baby. Her's a good baby. Her getting tired, isn't her? Those brothers are so crazy. Come on, Trisha. It's not your baby. That animal had a mother, a real mother, a real chimpanzee mother. And to suggest that, like in Project Nim, I mean, Stephanie Lafarge was like, he's my baby and all that sort of thing. I'm like, no, he wasn't. That was Carolyn's baby, Carolyn the chimp. And when we took that animal, you're stealing that mother's baby. How dare us, you know? And then say that we're cross-fostering or any of that kind of stuff, which is complete bullshit. Uh, and, uh, and I just don't agree with that. This is Sequoia Washoe's baby. He, uh, he's a special guy and didn't last more than a couple of months. But he's right there. Uh, and uh, he, he meant a lot to a lot of us. And unfortunately, uh, because of our arrogance, we thought that we knew better. Uh, he ended up being, you know, not, not making it. This is one of my chimp friends, and uh, they were drawing on the back of this, and then this chimp got it, chewed it all up, and they put it all back together for me. Bob and his colleagues eventually succeeded in getting Nim released from the testing lab and placed in a sanctuary. He lived alone in that sanctuary for almost a decade. That's Onan's footprint. You can see how big his foot was. Uh, that, that means a lot to me because I remember that day. I remember taking his foot, putting it on the paint, and then, come on, Onan, let's make some footprints. You know, so uh, back when I, uh, I hadn't come to the spot where I am now. I mean, like, here's Moja holding a camera, very similar to yours. And she was a great photographer, actually. Uh, she knew how the camera worked and all that. Nim had a Polaroid, so uh, we would let him take, my idea was that we were gonna let Nim take pictures of his favorite places and then place them on a map or whatever and uh, on the floor of his in enclosure. And then we would also have a book and, and we would, you know, figure out exactly because planning and that that sort of thing in the 70s was not you know not something that we knew or understood much about in terms of chimps so I thought well he wants to go to a certain place let's see if he can tell me where he wants to go in pictures and sign and all that cognitive mapping and that sort of thing but uh, but then the then the the ethical issues started to creep in and I started to realize that's really silly Nim eventually lived out his life with some of his chimp companions, and he died of heart failure at the age of 26. Bob maintained contact with him whenever he was able. I feel that I uh, am a lucky guy to have had this kind of experience in my life, and that uh, not very many people get to inter interact with chimps on that level and uh, one day, maybe 200 years from now, uh, people will look back to this and see me uh, and, and see, uh, understand exactly why I did it, because maybe all these problems will be solved and chimps will be, you know, in the wild and, it, you know, still there if, if the planet exists at all in 200 years. And, and they'll look back and go, wow, that guy was one of the last people to ever get to interact with chimps on that level. Not that I'm proud of that, because if I could go back now, I would probably, if I were God, I would go back and stop importation of chimps at all into any country and all that sort of thing, but I'm not. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, when there wasn't a moratorium on breeding and that sort of thing, now we are, we're pretty aware of, you know, because captivity is the enemy. I mean, for all exotic animals. I mean, you put them out of, you take them out of the context that they should be in and put them into a cage, uh, that changes that animal profoundly. She was crushed. It's like she just lost her husband all over again. 
I think that's how she felt. I never thought it was going to happen. I always thought she was always going to be here. I never had a problem with her. It's like an empty space in your heart, you know. In 2015, not long after her husband Jim passed away, Laura Matson lost another family member, taken from her suburban Los Angeles home in a dramatic raid by authorities. Jackson, an eight-foot alligator, had lived with the Matsons in their yard of their North Hollywood home for 38 years. Jackson and Laura's story is an incredible account of a very unconventional friendship. She was a gentle animal. I mean, she never attempted anything. But when you're raised with an animal, they, um, I think they know not to be aggressive or whatever, because she never was aggressive at all. So um, when she wanted something, she let me know. She just opened up the sliding glass door and walked on in. Listening to Laura, it's easy to forget that she's talking about an alligator, a 300-pound apex predator that could easily kill her. I would take her in my bedroom at night if I could. <laughs> you know, but that would, someone told me to get a man. <laughs> so. <laughs> Laura comes from a large family, and while she was struggling with losing her companion, Brother Ron offered unwavering support. He, too, had formed a strong bond with Jackson, the alligator. Oh, I loved her. Good animal. I was aware, so you got to stay aware. I mean, it's, it's an alligator. And we were just used to it. You know, coming out, getting into the pen, doing what we had to do as far as cleaning the pen and feeding the alligator was an everyday thing for us. But while Jackson wasn't Laura's first unusual pet, Ron has never kept any exotic animals. My sister. <laughs> She's got every animal. All I had to do was walk across the street. <laughs> A little dog named Herbie. <laughs> and rats. <laughs> well, that's because my husband had a boa constrictor, and I had to save the rat. <laughs> and then, of course, he populated. <laughs> I had a raccoon and a quail. <laughs> so I had a beaver. <laughs> but I had to give the beaver back. But, uh, and a groundhog or one of those things underneath the ground in Thousand Oaks. Well, he was so cute, you know. But uh, they need special places. <laughs> so, now I'm thinking, uh, no, <laughs> a beaver. <laughs> Everybody's trees are missing. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they'll be pointing at my house. <laughs> <laughs> it was Laura's husband, Jim, who first brought Jackson home in 1977. Over the next four decades, the potentially deadly reptile became part of the Matson family. He loved Jackson. He looked for Jackson, just like he looked for his 50 Merc. You know, so it took him a long time to find him. He first found a caiman which is like an alligator, but he was mean. So um, he ended up getting Jackson. This is where Jackson lived for 30, 38 years. <laughs> well, the first couple of years she lived in the house. Well, she was in the bathroom, in the, in the bathtub, and she loved the water. Uh, she would get out, and finally, when she was starting getting out more and more and more and going out to the bathroom door, that's when we decided to give her own little thing out here. So, and she loved it out here, I think. Most animal experts agree that reptiles barely recognize their owners, let alone form emotional attachments. But Jackson seems to have been an exception. I think she really missed my husband after he passed because I would see her, she, she, she almost like went into depression. She, I, mean, I didn't, I thought, Ronnie, Something's wrong with her. You know, she's not coming out. Something's wrong. And so he'd go in there. No, she's she's okay. She growled, <laughs> but she 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 was in there for a long period of time. She didn't come out. 
I don't know if they sensed something, but she changed a little bit because he wasn't there every day. After Jim passed away, Laura continued to care for Jackson, although she did try unsuccessfully to rehome their immense pet. To Laura, Jackson was a placid animal who never showed any signs of aggression, not even towards her own pet cats, one of whom still lives with her. They're not predators. I'm sure if they're out in the wild and they're hungry, of course they're predators. When they're well fed, they're a beautiful animal. Laura may have thought Jackson to be a beautiful animal, but how did her neighbors feel about living so near to a dangerous predator? Everybody knew about her, so even the neighbors across the street, everybody knew about her. Everybody wanted pictures of her. Once they saw her, they were fine. No one ever went and turned me in or turned us in all those years. Jackson was not a secret. And for some reason, I didn't think she needed to be a secret. While most of Laura's neighbors felt safe enough having Jackson nearby, not everyone would be happy living next door to an alligator. Best known for her role as Mary Ann on the classic TV sitcom Gilligan's Island, Don Wells is one North Hollywood resident who wouldn't want a prehistoric predator in her neighborhood. I'd move. <laughs> I'd sell my house and move. I don't think I could talk them out of it. Remember the little ones that you used to get? Maybe you are from America, but you used to circus. You used to get little tiny alligators and you take them home. Really? It is circus, yes. Yes, little turtles and little alligators and people put them in their bathtubs. I don't know if they ever grew up. I don't know if they died because they weren't in their habitat, which is awful. But yes, you used to be able to take a little alligator home. Jackson the alligator had lived peacefully in the Matson suburban backyard for more than 30 years without incident and without being reported until a man passing the home saw Jackson and reported her presence to the authorities. Ron, recognizing the danger to his sister and her pet, confronted him. I didn't handle that part too well. You know, he did what he had to do because he thought he was saving the community. Uh, I don't know how he really ended up back here in the backyard, but he did. She got a broken heart. He must have got some type of satisfaction from it. But, uh... No, someone I didn't even ever knew. He didn't even live in the neighborhood. He went up my driveway and he saw Jackson, and he was right on the phone immediately. I can't believe anybody could keep an alligator. You couldn't train an alligator to be a pet. If he wants to eat you, he's gonna eat you. Two days later, authorities visited Laura's house, trying to confirm Jackson's presence and to make arrangements for her removal. But their first visit to Laura's home saw them leave empty-handed. The second day, I, I started seeing them kind of trying to come over this wall over here. Then they came up, tried to come over this wall, but I stopped both of them. They had to have a warrant can't just come on somebody's property without a warrant. How I noticed it wasn't good for us is because they had a car here, here, and on the corner. So I, like I told my sister, it's over. OK, so I already knew this was the day, which ended up not being the day. They couldn't find Jackson when they came in here. So three months later, I said, I think we should do something quickly because they go, no, they're going to come back. <laughs> the report about Jackson claimed that Laura had been feeding her feral cats, and even some neighborhood cats had gone missing. When authorities canvassed the suburb, only 11 reports of missing pets were recorded over the previous 40 years. Never aggressive, never. She was well fed, too, so there was no need for her to look for food. And plus, she was picky. She only liked chicken hot dogs. I tried to give her fish. I tried to give her other stuff. No way. She just threw it out of her mouth.
Local police and officers from Animal Control and U.S. Fish and Wildlife soon returned with a warrant required to search Laura's property to find and remove Jackson. I heard some commotion out here, and I just knew from the voices that it was something was going to happen. They weren't going to settle for anything. They were, Jackson was gone, no matter what. I knew it. I think my sister knew it. So, no. <clears throat> I'm not saying we were, we broke the law, uh, but we did get attached. So, uh, they did their job, we did ours. Let's, let's put it that way. It was horrible, especially when they, they um, got a warrant and they, they went through everything in my house. I'm thinking, there's no alligators in my kitchen drawer. I mean, they went through every drawer. I don't know what they were looking for because Jackson was outside. I wish I would have thought about putting her underneath the house. <laughs> you know, but I didn't think about that till later. So, but they probably wouldn't have left because this guy took a picture of her. That turned me in, so. Laura was right. This time, the authorities were not leaving without Jackson. Once I seen the warrant, I knew we had a problem. I knew my sister was in here sleeping. I knew I had to get her out because they weren't leaving. My job is to protect her. And just one thing led to another. And next thing we know, we got them all over the property. Right. The police officers, uh, animal control, uh, the zoo ended up coming. So. I had no rights whatsoever. They wouldn't tell me anything about her. They wouldn't let me see her, nothing. They came back and they finally found Jackson and well, we helped them put it in the truck and off to the zoo it went. And then we uh, set up a habitat for her. So she's doing real well now, real well, yeah. Jackson was rehomed at an alligator park in Colorado, and a GoFundMe campaign was launched to create a new habitat. We were the biggest uh, donors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but she's she's happy, and we will get it back out there to see her. Despite taking good care of Jackson since the 70s, by not having the relevant permit, Laura was breaking California law. But as any animal lover knows, losing a pet is hard, let alone a pet that has been your constant companion for nearly 40 years. Now that they ran their law down, how it really works, okay, I understand now. But at that point, you don't think about stuff like that. Even if they would have told me afterwards, I wouldn't have cared about that law. I just kept doing what I was doing. Because you get attached, and once you get attached, it's it. I think she probably misses me. She, I'm sure she misses the chicken legs and the hot dogs. When I go to bed at night, I think of her because that's when she would make the thumping noises. And I miss that, so. But um, I'm glad where she's at. She's in a beautiful place, so.